if I were to show you my imaginary diary, listed under the year 2024 somewhere near the top of that list, you'd find a checkbox. And next to that checkbox, the words, learn more about watchmaking. Well, I'm happy to report that I can finally tick that checkbox now. I'm the Timist. Join me as I dip my toes into the fascinating world of watchmaking. Founded in 1866, the Horological Society of New York is one of the oldest continuously operating horological associations in the world, and in fact is the very first watchmaking guild in America. Comprised of a diverse mix of members, ranging from watchmakers, clockmakers, executives, journalists, auctioneers, historians, salespeople, and collectors, it operates as a nonprofit organization that is entirely dedicated to the singular pursuit of advancing the art and science of horology through education. And in 2016, they took this passion on the road, introducing their traveling education program, specifically a four-hour course covering material from Horology 101 through 103 with hands-on classes taught by HSNY staff of professional watchmakers who guide students on the disassembly and reassembly of a complete mechanical watch movement. Lucky for me, that's exactly the same thing that I wanted to do advance my understanding and education of watchmaking. Even luckier for me is that I was asked by Benbridge Jeweler, a company that's native to the Pacific Northwest and one I've already covered in a previous video, if I would be interested in attending one of the watchmaking courses as their guest. Well, since you're watching this video, I think it's safe to assume that you already know what my answer was. This is Steve Eagle. He's the director of education at HSNY, and he's also a classically trained watchmaker, having worked for Rolex in New York after graduating in 2011 from the Lidditz Watch Technicum. Steve will guide us through the disassembly process of the watch movement. This is Brianna Lee, an HSNY trustee and also a classically trained watchmaker. Brianna will guide us through the reassembly of the watch movement. This is Tim Lewis. Tim and I go back, so uh, I'm just going to let him tell us a bit about himself. I'm Tim Lewis. I'm the watch repair manager for Benbridge Jeweler, and I oversee all of the branded uh, timepieces for in-house repairs and also relations with our partners. I've been doing this for 32 years. I've been with Benbridge for 32 years. So now that we know who Steve, Brianna, and Tim are, let's prep our workstations, clear our minds, put our phones on silent, and start our watchmaking lesson. Steve kicks things off by giving us a brief history lesson on the Horological Society of New York itself, as well as some foundational differences that we need to keep in mind when comparing pocket watches to wrist-worn watches, as well as an overview of the different types of power source regulation currently available. Speaking of regulation, Every single mechanical watch needs an escapement to control the release of the energy. And every single mechanical watch needs some type of oscillator to regulate how quickly that energy is released. Of course, most companies don't keep everything in a straight line like this. We like to kind of conserve some space, uh, maybe push it all together a little bit so it'll fit more easily on, say, a round main plate. So same, same connection, barrel to the center rail through the gear train to the balance. And now it's time for us to take a closer look at the movement itself, the star of the show, in a way, the Etta 6497, a mechanical manual winding beauty whose heart ticks at 18,000 vibrations per hour and will continue to tick away for at least 46 hours when fully wound. It's at this point where seasoned watchmakers will recognize that this Etta 6497 movement is in fact the same movement that they themselves more than likely practiced on when they first started watchmaking school. I thought this was a super cool fact because, well, this course could have very well been the start of a new career for many attendees that have already taken it, or the genesis of a wonderful new story for any future attendee. And with that, we take all of our theoretical knowledge and begin our hands-on portion of the course by starting with the most delicate part of the operation, the removal of the balance wheel. Equipped with the watchmaker's eye loop and my finger caught securely in place in order to protect the movement from any oil or sweat that may be generated during the handling of the movement, I begin by unscrewing a couple of teeny tiny screws in order to gain access to the bridge that cradles the balance wheel. Now, did I immediately, somehow, as if by telepathic manipulation, cause both Tim and Brianna to stop by and provide some guiding advice? Perhaps. Who's to say? 
Anyway, with the balance wheel and bridge safely removed, we've now exposed the pallet fork. So we remove yet even more tiny screws from the pallet bridge and the pallet bridge itself so we can remove the pallet fork as we continue the disassembly process. And once again, I am expertly advised by Tim on how to increase my tweezer success rate by simply keeping them more flat and coming in sideways to grab more of the flathead sections of both the screws and the bridges. Next, now believe it or not, we unscrew even more tiny screws in order to remove another bridge and expose the gear train and get access to the hardworking wheels below. Once exposed, we carefully remove all four wheels and store them on our dedicated tray. It's at this point where I am so thankful that someone invented the watchmaker's loop, because let me tell you, it makes working at this scale so much more manageable. Also, keep in mind that the ETA 6497 movement is considered to be a medium to large sized movement. Imagine working on a tiny movement with pins and arbors 10 times smaller than the width of a single strand of your hair. Now, moving on, we focus on unscrewing the crown wheel and removing the crown wheel ring, which to my nerd eye look like the tiniest one ring to rule them all, ring. Next, we remove the ratchet wheel screw, which is one of the biggest screws within the movement. And once that's safely put away, I begin multiple attempts at grabbing the ratchet wheel itself, unsuccessfully. Until Brianna takes notice and kindly drops by to assist my Shrek-like ogre hands. Now because this isn't a how to become a watchmaker tutorial per se, I'll navigate past some of the work and mention some of the standout portions for your convenience. One of those standout moments was when I removed the train wheel bridge. Very satisfying, just because it was so big and it combined three jewels, which was pretty cool to see up close. Next, we removed the center wheel and the barrel, which contains the inner spring. And although we didn't open up the barrel itself for convenience's sake, we did get a barrel spring passed around so we can all see what it looks like once uncoiled. After flipping the movement within the movement holder, we remove another tiny screw which frees up the setting lever jumper. Then, carefully pin down the yoke spring and keep it safely secured, so it doesn't escape our clutches at the speed of light never to be seen again. Skipping forward a bit, to the part where I felt most confident, and just before the disassembly finish line. Collect those two pinions and put them into your tray. Yeah, I don't think that was supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> just what we want to hear at the bench yes now i'm no, uh, I'm, just, I'm no watchmaker <laughs> okay it, but i don't think that was supposed to happen uh, the, the parts that were supposed to come out did come out mm -hmm. so i'll give you that and then, maybe a, a little bit uh, an ulterior direction but mm -hmm. that's not important now right we can collect them and put them into the tray mm -hmm. so that's your stem and so even with that tiny little mishap at the end there that brought us to the halfway mark of the course I successfully disassembled an ETA 6497 movement without breaking or losing any parts. We congratulated each other and then took a 15 minute break to recharge a bit, grab a coffee, stretch, commiserate amongst each other on the toughest or finickiest parts of the process because hey, we were all in this together. Now I may not be a fully certified watchmaker, yet, but I'll say it now, never ever complain to your watchmaker that the repair times that they're quoting you are too long. Believe me, you want them to take their time. You want the work to be done right, and you want the parts and finishing to be of the highest standard. And that means not rushing your watchmakers. Now, with everyone back in their seats, Brianna takes the lead on the second half of the day, helping us take everything we just disassembled and reassembling it back together. But before that, Brianna takes some time to provide some valuable advice, things she's learned over the years and has seen success with. And with that, we start the reassembly process, working backwards, starting with the placement of the barrel and then followed shortly thereafter by the center wheel and the beautiful jeweled barrel bridge. If placed correctly, you can actually actuate the barrel wheel to see if the center wheel turns elegantly within the jewel. Very satisfying, I must say. Once we verify it's properly in place, we pay a visit to all those tiny screws we previously took out, and we put them back in to secure the barrel bridge. Next, we flip our movement, take it out of the holder, find the driver cannon pinion, and use the flat tail end of our tweezers to press and click it into place with a satisfying... There we go. After that, we put the sliding pinion in, followed by the winding pinion, and lastly, the crown itself. 
Forwarding through some of the tightening work, we place the yoke inside the movement and position it in such a way that when we come in to place the yoke spring, it has the space to slide in and then push up against the yoke itself. This was easier said than done because the yoke spring needs to be put under tension to be slid into place. And uh, I won't mention any names, but uh, some of my classmates managed to help their yoke springs experience the miracle of flight. Next, we place the minute, intermediate, and setting wheel, followed by the setting lever jumper, which needed to be screwed down and secured in place to basically keep bits like the yoke spring from flying out. You know, I, I think I'm really getting the hang of... Ne never mind. Disregard. Uh, I'm so sorry, Steve and Brianna. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Hey, look! Uh, the crown is engaging and activating the center wheel. I did that. With your help. Moving on, we pick up what looks to be the Hobbit equivalent of Tolkien's Ring of Power, more commonly known as the Crown Wheel Ring. Anyways, atop that goes the crown wheel itself and one of the larger screws to secure it in place. However, this screw tightens in the opposite direction. It's normally lefty-loosey, righty-tighty, but in this case, we reverse that. Left is tight, right is loose. Now for the next part, Brianna advised us to move delicately, as though we were gentle giants. Remember, those pivots I was describing earlier as being thinner than a strand of your hair? Well, it's true. And so we took our time when placing the third and second wheel in the respective jewels. The last thing we put in was the escapement wheel. Now, with all those wheels interlocking and housed in their respective jewels, it was time to secure them in place with the jeweled train wheel bridge. Which, again, like basically everything else in this class, is a lot easier said than done because you can shimmy those wheels out of their sockets if you don't line up the bridge and land it straight as you're coming down. Luckily for me, my years of experience playing Tetris finally have paid off. I will say that even Tim seemed mildly impressed when he stopped by to verify. Now I needed to secure the bridge down with, uh, you guessed it, tiny screws. With each turn of the screw, I knew the final boss was lurking just around the corner, but I couldn't worry about that just yet. The delicate but very cool looking pallet fork needed to be set in place, followed by the pallet bridge. Finally, after first making its acquaintance a little over four hours ago, it was time to say hello to my good friend, the balance wheel. It appears so delicate and so fragile that the thought of a sneeze alone feels like it would be enough to have it basically disintegrate. Even so, with the encouragement of Steve, Brianna, and Tim, we all took on the final challenge and I'm happy to report that we all managed to get our balance springs set. The ETA 6497 sprung to life and it was one of the best feelings ever. This was legitimately one of the coolest watch related things that I've ever been a part of. So a big thank you to Benbridge and the Horological Society of New York. I'm so grateful to everyone that was involved in organizing this incredible experience. I have a whole new appreciation for the inner workings of a wristwatch and gained an even greater level of respect for all watchmakers out there. I personally would recommend this class to anyone, even if they're not into watches. It's that good. And I say that because there's a lot of overlap between material sciences, mechanical engineering, chemistry even, and of course, intricate watchmaking. So if any of what you've seen or heard here today intrigues you, even a little bit, I'd recommend you check out the education section of the HSNY website. I'll link it in the description as well. Just be aware that their classes fill up fairly quickly, and I'm lucky to have been a guest of Benbridge Jeweler so I could attend. I'm The Timist. Thanks for watching. I really do hope you enjoy this video and that you learned something. If you did, please do me a favor and give this video a like. Consider subscribing for more content like this. And as always, if you have any questions or thoughts you want to share, drop them in the comments below. Be well, and I'll see you in the next one.